Come, Lucas. Parkour. House parties. Does anybody remember the movie? A kid and play? <laughs> You're showing your age. <laughs> oh, wow. That was a bad movie. And then they made a second one. And a third. I'm learning. So we learn something new every day, folks. House parties. Man, who, who wants to party at a house? All right, good. Then you're going to have a great time tonight. You're going to have a great time tonight. So, you know, here's the thing. Who doesn't need community? Like, that, if I say to you, who needs community, it's all of us. It's all of us. None of us are, like, too good for it or, like, at a level in life where you're like, nah, people, friends, community, relationships, just I'm beyond that now, man. I'm beyond that now. Like, nobody gets there. You know what I'm saying? And so who needs community? We all do. That's why this message and this thing is so amazing. It's because it speaks to all of us. Um, I remember when I was a young boy, me and my dad were doing something in our front yard. And we lived in the country and so didn't run into kids on my road. There was no kids on my road. But then... This was really odd. We're in the front yard doing something, maybe like yard work, and across the street, um, there there was a few houses across the street, and I've never witnessed a single person in the around the house in the yard, even coming out of the driveway. Like one some of those homes where they're just like ghost homes, right? And then, like in the yard, because the yard on the other side of the yard kind of dipped down, and then the house came up on top of a hill. Well, down in the dip, there was this football being thrown just up into the air, and then it come down. And then it would, went up into the air, and it come down. And my dad goes, there's, there's somebody throwing a football to themselves over there. They must be just, like, throwing the football in the air and then catching it. And my dad goes, I bet, I bet it's a kid your age. And as a preteen boy, the fear wells up in me. I know what my dad's going to make me do. My dad is such a jerk. He's going to make me go over to that got kid and be friends. <laughs> like, that's what preteen boys think. And so sure enough, he says, I want you to go over there. I want you to play with him. I'm like, oh, t- I'm so embarrassed. All Like, every preteen boy's angst and insecurity rises to the surface at a rushing level of, like, just intensity. It's like everything in me doesn't want to do this, but I, I can't disobey my dad because he spanks me. So I'm going, to, I'm going, you know, I'm going. And everything in me hates as I hates this journey across the street. And I get over the hill, and remember, I'm preteen Luke. Awkward. Everything's awkward. You get over the hill, and you make eye contact. He stares at me. I stare at him. What do you say now? What is the next thing you do? I don't know. Community is hard. Friendship is hard. Something happened. We struck up a conversation. He threw me the football. He had a good arm. I respected that. I see that arm. I threw it back. He respected me. We're friends now. That's how guys make friends. And so we actually became friends. My dad came over, and he was throwing us routes, and we were, like, playing against each other, defense, offense, taking turns, running, uh, running passing patterns, and having a lot of fun. We actually became really good friends, like really good friends. And you know what? If, if my dad never forced me across the street, I would have never, ever been friends with this kid. And we ended up having a ton in common. Thank God he lived on a lake. Whew. Right? And I was like in heaven. I made a great friend who lived right across the street from me. I didn't have any friends around me. He lived on a lake. He had a Super Nintendo. And he had video games. And he was fun. And he was my age. We had common interests. Believe it or not, I met a kid who lived across the street from me who was my age. And we had common interests. Amazing, right? Weird. That's kind of though how we treat people. We're like, that we see people we don't know and we're like... We immediately assume there's nothing in common, there's nothing to say, there's nothing to talk about. How do I strike up a conversation? What would I even do with this person as we talk? 
what are they, what is he or she expecting of me in this conversation? And I found it was so easy to become friends with somebody. It was so easy. Community is so important. And you know, so this message, this really quick message, I have six minutes. <laughs> so quick. I've got five minutes now. Um, we're going to talk to you guys about the importance of being in a house party. But this message isn't just for those who are going to attend the house party. I want my house party leaders to pay attention to this message as well. You ready? So here we go. You are your best when you are these four things. Number one is this. You are your, you are your best when you are in a consistent rhythm. Now, this is about community and friendship. So... Here's the thing. I personally grate against consistency. I, personality type-wise, get bored with the same thing all the time. Some of you might not. Some of you might be like, yeah, me too. I don't like my morning routine to stay the same. Sometimes I just get up and I eat a Pop-Tart right away just to throw a wrench in the system. You know, but others of you are like, no way, you get up in the morning, it's shower, it's shave, it's, you know, brush the teeth, it's breakfast, it's coffee, it's then check the mirror one more time, head out the door. You are all about consistency. So, so for me, though, I don't really like consistency. But when it comes to relationships, you are, you are your best when you're in a consistent rhythm, okay? So here's the thing. I don't like being consistent myself, but I really enjoy consistency from others. And let me explain. I love Taco Bell. But I would be frustrated if the Taco Bell guy making my taco got tired of being consistent and just decided to change it up a bit. <laughs> Bored with putting meat, cheese, <laughs> lettuce, tomato, shell. He was just like, meat, cheese, paper. Because <laughs> his job's now more fun. Like, but as I bite, I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm mad now because my taco has paper. You see, <laughs> we enjoy consistency, believe it or not, right? I don't want my taco to be different every single time I go to Taco Bell. And neither do you. You go to Taco Bell because you know you like their food, and when you get it and you go to eat it, you know what you're about to expect. Have you ever um, sat down and eat your food, and you had, like, a, a water, and you were drinking water, but then the person next to you had a Sprite, and then you accidentally grabbed their drink, and you drink Sprite, which is good, but when your brain thinks water... And you Sprite hits your mouth like, what is this? Oh, I like this. <laughs> that was just a tangent, man. It's nothing to do with my message. Uh, okay, so listen. I got three minutes. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 5 says this. It says, oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. You see, you see, it is important that there is consistency in life. Now, you might not like it because you get a little bored, but boy, when it comes to relationships, you can't have a thriving, great relationship without consistency. Try to prove me wrong. That's what I thought. Number two, you are your best when you are accessible. You are your best when you are accessible in relationships. So being available and accessible in a relationship shows many things. And here's just a few. It shows that you love when you're available and accessible. It shows that you care when you're available and accessible. It shows that you have some, like, mercy in you. Um, mer you know, some of us have taken our, those personality tests, maybe with some of those motivational gift tests. I scored a zero on mercy. It's out of 100. <laughs> That's so bad. I'm embarrassed. But... <laughs> When you're accessible to people, it actually shows that you have mercy, that you kind of think. It shows that you have, em you have empathy for people, you have sympathy for people, a little bit different, kind of the same. And, you know, it shows that you respect people. So you are your best when you're available, when you're accessible, when, when, when you answer your phone when people call, when you respond to text messages in a good, timely fashion when people call, that you return phone calls, that you answer emails. Boy, you know, just answering emails, responding to texts, that shows a... That shows you're accessible. It shows that you respect them. It shows that you respect them. And, and, and sometimes, though, we'll get that text message and we'll, we'll look at it and we'll go, uh, I don't need to answer them. And what, but what does that show? That shows that you've put yourself on a different level and they're, they're not on your level. It's like, get on my level, bro. You're not on my level. I'm not going to answer this text. 
boy, you know what? Woo. That's bad. That's bad thinking. That's bad thought processes. It's a bad attitude. You can't, you can't do that. Being accessible to people is where it's at. It's, it's you are your best when you're accessible. You're your best. Am I talking to my generation or what right now? Come on. All right. Mark 7.34 says this. It says, looking up to heaven, he sighed. This is Jesus. And he said, I bet you didn't think he was going to say this. <laughs> Ephatha. Translated, which means be opened. Be opened. So Jesus has made a way for complete accessibility to God. And God's way above our level. If there's any thing in human existence that can officially say, get on my level, brah, it's God. But he has come down to us and made it open and made himself accessible to us at all times. Wow. So we should be accessible too. Number three, I'm done. I'm time's up. We're, we're going fast. Number three, you are your best when you are a people person. A people person. Not a cat person. <laughs> no. No, not, not, not a cat person. You know, a, a people person, ladies. Even you guys. Single, men have been single for too long. Getting into cats. We could talk. It's a whole other conversation. <laughs> a people person. Man, here's the thing, though. You know, I, I know not every single person here, not every single person here is naturally a people person. Let's be honest, right? There are times where you walk into even a, a, a service like this, and you're just in a, in a mood of, like, kind of just wanting to be alone but still wanting to be a part of the group. Right? That's cool. I'm fine with that. Honestly, I get like that too. Trust me. But here's the thing. You can't always completely shut people out. You've got to be a people person at times. Here's the thing. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's, um, you can't walk out your Christianity without letting people into your life and making friends. You really can't. You can't walk out your faith without being a people person. You can't isolate yourself from people and say, I am now the better Christian. No, no. If you end up isolating yourself from people, you are walking in the wrong direction with your faith. Walking toward people is where it's at. So we've got to strive to just be a people person. Now, here's what 3 John 1.6 says. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. There really might not be a more powerful witness than to show the, to the world than to have them see your friends. Have them see your love for one another. Uh, I, I, was, I was changed as a college student. I mean, phys I mean, really, I was changed and moved as a college student, watching love for my friends happen between our group. You understand what I'm saying? And if you're a people person and you're a, you've got friends, that is a witness to the world of how great God is. Your love for one another is a witness to the world, to how great God is. People are longing for authentic relationship. Longing for it. They're searching for it. Nobody's like, today, I want shallow, backbiting relationships. That's where it's at. I want somebody I don't, have, I can't be myself around today. I want to put on a mask and pretend to be somebody else for years. No. No, no, no. Everybody wants authentic, true friendship. And I know so many people who walked towards the church because they saw and witnessed true, authentic friendship and relationship. We can be that church. We can be those people. Our groups, our house parties can be that kind of atmosphere. Amen? Amen? Amen. Last thing here. You are your best when you're having fun. Right? Right? Like, fun. Like, come on. No one wakes up in the morning and says, and I wrote this down. 
No one wakes up in the morning and says, I hope today is no fun. I hope today is hard and boring. I want to go home with regret. No. No, and if you do wake up thinking that, you're insane. And you need help. And we can get you that, that somewhere else. So that's a different kind of thing, you know. But fun. You are your best when you're fun. You know, life should be enjoyed, not just endured all the time. Church should be enjoyed, not just endured. Man, it should be fun. Now, here's the thing. When the idea of a small group or a house party or a connect group or a life group, which we've all heard all these terms, you know, in our maybe we're all from kind of different churches and we've, we're, we belong to like a small group in our church. The idea of a small group, can I be honest with you guys tonight? Can I be real and authentic tonight? I, I actually don't really enjoy small groups. Boom, I said it. Oh, that feels good. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That feels good. I feel like get that off my chest a little bit. But how can I preach to you guys about it then? It's because the small groups environments that I've been in haven't been what I've been talking about. They haven't been that. And, and many of you are thinking right now of what your small group is going to look and feel like. It's going to be <laughs> it's going to be a bunch of people sitting in a circle asking each other how your feelings are and, and probing you about sin. Making you feel guilty about choices you've made. It's going to be people bragging about how much they read the Bible. And when it comes to you, you're going to have to, like, lie. Because you don't want to be the outcast. Right? And it's going to last too long. You're going to get hours in a hot house with just vegetables and water on a paper plate. Oh, oh, this is the worst. This is, yes, I've been in that situation Hundreds of times. That's why I don't like small groups. And I drew something out today, but I got to give credit where credit is due. I got this illustration from a guy named, from a pastor named Todd Ingstrom. And he's a pastor in Austin, Texas. He had this illustration and I drew it out because I want to show it to you guys. Because there is such a difference between how the world builds community and how the church builds community. But today we're going to learn that the world actually does it better. You ready? So go ahead and throw up this illustration. So we see here on the left, I've got, some, I got four questions. How, what, when, and where. You see that? And at the top, I see Christian and then non-Christian. You see the differences in the, in the, in the up-downs there? So this is, this is where the church tells people to build community. It's either in the church or in a house. But the world doesn't build community like that. Where do they build community? They, they build community at sporting events, at the restaurants, at the coffee shops. That's a tree with a bird on a limb. <laughs> at a park. My wife, when she's trying to build community with our neighbors, because we live in a neighborhood, they go to the park with their kids. They don't come into my house and sit in a circle stare at each other for a couple hours. You see, you see how weird it gets? But what I'm thinking is this. It's make sure your house party isn't creepy. Can I get a clap? But it's but it's real. It's real. Okay? And Okay, so when? When does community get built? So here we go. Where, when? The church will be like, put it on the calendar twice a week. Wednesday, Friday. See, that's my calendar. Twice a week. But when does the world be, build community? When it's convenient. Why? Kids, jobs, activities. You got to eat sometime during the day. You're just tired. Man, you're lucky to build community with the world once a month, right? And I think many times as church in churches, we put times of building community on the calendar, and when people aren't there, we outcast them. And that's wrong. That's wrong. 
We take attendance too much, honestly. The world doesn't take attendance. You know, hey, we're all going to Buffalo Wild Wings to watch the game. We need some wings and burp and awesome. If you can show up, cool. If you can't, it's all good. But we're like, <laughs> you know, 4 p.m. on a Friday. Where in the world were you? You were sinning, weren't you? You were out there doing something sinful. I bet you were speeding down Hickory Ridge Road. We're like, oh, no wonder nobody wants to come. We're too, we're too like regiment and crazy about it. And it's just not practical with real living. Okay, so what do we talk about? When it comes to churches, small groups, you either talk about me, 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 or we talk about the Bible. But the world doesn't talk about that stuff. The world talks about America. That's a flag. It's politics. The world talks about food. That's a sandwich. They talk about TV. Talk about stuff like that. Sports and how sucky the lions are. But when we come together, we don't have natural conversations very often. We get into the house, we're given a paper cup and a paper plate with some vegetables, and we're like, they just ask you right away, when did you look at pornography last? You're like, wow. <laughs> Not even like a formal hello. It's just like, that was intense, son. <laughs> I'm not comfortable yet. I haven't even like. I don't know. I still have my shoes on. But, like, that's kind of what we think is going to happen in our house parties, right? I want our house parties to be real. Hey, listen, you know what? <laughs> if somebody's not getting filled with the Spirit at your house group every single time, it still was a successful gathering. You talked. You hung out. You built relationships. You built community. Maybe you prayed for one another. Maybe you did open the Bible. But let's be more real. I mean, this is the left side is why I don't like it. It's not real life. Nobody can, nobody can operate at that level all the time. So here's the thing. And then how do, we, how do we interact? We get in a circle, and it's like we talk across from each other, right? But how do you interact in the real world? You go to the movies, and you sit in rows, and you shoulder to shoulder. You go to the park. You're at the restaurant. You're watching the game. You're... You're not sitting in a circle. But this is why it's intimidating. It's because sometimes we force ourselves to do things that aren't natural. And sometimes we don't go to our house party, we don't go to a small group because everything on the left intimidates us and scares us and it's so unnatural that we don't want to be a part of it. But can I say this? Let's strive to be more like the right side. Let's strive to build community. Take your, go out to the movies as a group. Have, play games. Play, you go to the park while the weather is nice. Go to the apple orchard while you can. Walk around. Do life together. Be real people. Not some, like, weird thing on the left. And it is weird on the left. It doesn't happen naturally. Because it's not there. It's not in us to do that stuff. And so that's it. That's my house party message. You are your best when you are in a consistent rhythm, accessible, a people person, and having fun with it. Let's be honest. Sometimes that stuff on the left it isn't fun at all. Like when all you're doing is talking about yourself, when all you're doing is just being asked how much you've sinned lately, when all you're doing is like intensely studying, intensely studying. I mean, I like to study kind of, but like you, when studying is over, then you have fun. <laughs> right? Come on. You're like, you can only study for so long. And they're like, finally done. Can we, like, talk for real now? Can we turn on the football game? It's Monday night. Like, you ever been in a small group like that? You're like, don't they know the football game's on? Why are we still praying? <laughs> am I a weird pastor or what? But am I, isn't that what you guys are thinking? It is. So let's not go crazy about this. Let's not kill ourselves over this. Let's be real. Let's be real. Let's do it like how we do it, right? All right, so what you're going to do now is you're going to sit there, and I'm going to hand the mic back over to Pastor Perdeepin. He's going to tell you what to do next. Does that sound good? All right, great. Here we go.